before. Um, we are recording the meeting um, so that uh, so that some people who, who weren't able to come um, will be able to, to view this later. So we're really happy to have um, Dr. David Kennedy with us today. He's a senior social behavioral scientist at the RAND Corporation. He was trained as a medical anthropologist and has conducted research on the intersection of culture, social networks, and health. And he has a lot of a wide range of me methodological interests with a primary specialty in collection of and analysis of personal networks. So um, since 2009, he's been leading development of a program that's called EgoWeb, now 2.0 version. And it's designed to enable the collection of personal as well as whole networks and is um, open source, it's freely available. Um, he'll, I'm sure he'll be sharing the website as we go. The software is being used by researchers worldwide across a range of disciplines, including health, management, uh, criminal justice, justice and education. Um, and he's used, uh, uh, Dr. Kennedy has used EgoWeb across a variety of projects that measure social networks in different populations and to develop and implement network-based interventions that aim to increase network quality and support. So um, he, today um, he's going to be giving a talk first on applied social network analysis. Um, and then we'll probably have a, a time for a break for questions. And then he's gonna use the second hour to provide an overview of how social ne network data collection software um, can enable both network research and social network interventions. So welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so I guess I'll go ahead and share the screen. Okay, is everything coming through okay? Yep, looks good. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, what I'm gonna talk about is, um, uh, so, uh, I was trying to think about how, how much I can get into 45 minutes. Um, so I was thinking about giving some overview of, of networks uh, because I'm not sure how many people are really familiar with them, but I, I, I don't think there's not enough time to cover some of the basics of that, but I'll introduce network interventions and I'll give a lot of examples of this approach to network-based behavior change interventions that I've been developing and I'll illustrate a lot of different network concepts. Um, uh, through that along the way. Um, and then I'll introduce EgoWeb 2.0, which is sort of uh, will illustrate uh, some of the issues with data collection um, and, and also the interventions. And then, you know, we can ask questions at the end. Um, so uh, basically why, so the basic question is why are social networks important? Why do we care? Um, and for those who are HIV researchers, uh, they should be somewhat familiar with this um, diagram. This is the network diagram. This is, you know, uh, produced or this was published in '84. This is right at the uh, at the beginnings of understanding uh, what HIV was and how it was spreading. And um, so there's a, this uh, sort of primary patient that was uh, detected to be uh, spreading it to a lot of different people, and these are connected to each other in different ways. So uh, it's definitely uh, very important for the spread of disease and during COVID, it's on top of everybody's mind. Um, but it's also, all networks are also important for lots of other things like um, people can spread information. So it doesn't have to be a disease spreading through a network, but spreading information through a network. Um, and um, uh, people can also provide support to each other. And all these, um, these circles here are individual people and the lines represent uh, some sort of relationship, some sort of tie. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, they've had sex with, it doesn't necessarily mean that they've transmitted disease. It can mean that they uh, have some sort of trust with each other, they have some sort of support, uh, or they influence each other to um, produce similar behaviors throughout the network, or they could just be people who provide each other with, with emotional support. Um, so, uh, and uh, understanding networks is, has for a long time been important in understanding social problems. So it's not just infectious diseases, um, this is a study in the 30s about uh, runaway youth and, and how their connections with each other influenced uh, predictions of runaways. Um, and uh, there's also a long history of networks being discussed in, in various literature. So this is a, um, a study in the 50s, it was a qualitative study 
uh, about uh, marriage and social networks of couples. Um, so it, a lot of what it dealt with was networks conceptually. Uh, and I have a project where we're actually you know, using network methods to measure the, those networks directly. Uh, so this, I mean, there hasn't been that many studies that have uh, measured the networks directly. So there, you'll see a lot, you'll see networks come up in a lot of different disciplines. Uh, the, the term networks will come up where there's not actually network data collection because it's conceptually there. Um, so it's been around a lot and there are, there's still efforts to uh, um, improve on or to test old uh, concepts that have been in the literature. Um, and um, uh, another thing is really important in public health is to sort of track down how diseases are spread. Uh, this is another example of uh, both network and ethnographic tools um, tracking down why there was this syphilis outbreak in the suburbs of Atlanta um, years ago. So there's a lot of, lot of different examples. Um, uh, one thing that has really um, spurred more research into networks and, and public health, uh, there was this uh, Framingham Heart Study, which was, began in 1948. Uh, it wasn't a, a network study. Over the years, they re-interviewed people um, and at, every time they interview them, they, like any longitudinal study, they ask people to name people that they're connected to that could be contacted in the future if they were trying to recontact the, the person in the study. Uh, well, these, um, uh, these authors uh, started a study where they uh, turned all that referral data into network data, and then they were able to connect all this health data to the network data over time. Um, so there's been a lot of studies that have been based off that data set. It's a really extraordinary uh, study, um, and uh, you know it's really challenging to replicate, uh, but it has produced a lot of uh, great insights. There uh, is a growing literature in uh, networks and, and health and public health. Uh, this is one key uh, uh, book that that covers a lot of ground. There are lots of different things in the, in the literature, um, and so the the author of this book, he's coming out with. I think he said, he said he's, uh, I recently talked to him, he's, he's working on a, a network intervention uh, book. So he's kind of a leading uh, author on network intervention. So I'll uh, jump into talking about that. Uh, so he has this article in Science that um, is a, a great article. It covers um, the uh, lots of uh, different aspects of network interventions. And so he, he pretty much identified four types of network interventions. Um, the, the network interventions that he talks about are they're primarily based on organizationally focused. Um, so people who are who are belonging to the same organization, like a school. Um, and in the, the, a lot of times the assumption about the networks uh, that, that are being intervened on is that they're a static network. Now, what I mean by that is it has the same uh, individuals, the, uh, this, this, the starting time point. Um, and then when you uh, want to make a change, you're assuming that that those connections between those individuals uh, stays the same over time. Uh, so uh, the this type here that's being illustrated in this diagram is the individual type, um, where you have a bunch of individuals who have been uh, given the intervention and uh, whether they've uh, adopted it or not. Uh, so it's, it's based on the theory of diffusion of innovation. So um, you could uh, give an intervention to every single person that's numbered here. So each all, each of these people each of these circles represents a person and they're numbered. Um, or you can um, strategically identify individuals uh, and you know, only intervene on a percentage of them uh, with the idea that if you're intervening on certain keynotes, uh, you're gonna be more likely to get like more bang for the buck for your intervention um, efforts. So if you like uh, gave the number one node up in the left-hand corner, intervention that would only be uh, likely to be spread to two. Whereas if you uh, targeted uh, number 37, and number eight um, and, and so on, these are the key nodes that would help you spread that. So you're identifying those nodes that are highly connected or they're connected in strategic ways. Um, so like node number 23 doesn't have a lot of connections but node number 23 is, is bridging two different groups. Uh, so that's the individual focused uh, network intervention. Um, another type is the segmentation, uh, where you actually identify specific groups uh, to intervene on. So you may just intervene on one group at a time. 
Uh, so network analysis can be used to identify subgroups. So the different colors of the, the nodes represent um, I, uh, subgroups that are identified with network algorithms. Um, and so they actually represent, represent structurally different, uh, different um, classes of people based on their shared uh, connections. Um, this induction type, it's uh, more focused on individuals uh, doing something with their connections. So there's uh, like a stimulation of a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Uh, there's things like word of mouth interventions or respond to different sampling where you, you focus on key individuals who are uh, then doing something with their connections rather than just getting the intervention and, and then spreading it. Um, so the fourth type, that's the one that I've been working on. It's an alteration type. Um, and it does not assume a static network. Uh, and that's key, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Um, so for example, like support groups, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, these are focused on changing people's networks. Uh, so you're not starting with same group of people, time one, time two, time three. Uh, you're trying to either completely replace certain types of nodes or add nodes or add, add specific ties. Uh, there's been a bunch of different reviews of network interventions uh, in the literature lately. Uh, and it seems just from reading those that the alteration type is the least common. Um, and I, I found this uh, quote interesting from the, the network intervention paper that I was just talking about, um, where Tom talks about how, you know, as a sort of a cautionary, a cautionary note at the end of the paper, just interviewing people about their network um, uh, and feed that, feeding that back to either people and community organizations, you, you can trigger positive results. Uh, there was a, uh, there's a, a conference recently, the North American Social Network uh, Association, where there was a study showing that a smoking intervention actually you know, triggered people to not just uh, stop smoking, but also to, to start disconnecting from non-smokers. Um, uh, and then he also adds that displaying the network diagrams uh, can actually cause changes uh, above and beyond uh, the programmatic activities. Um, so for me, this is a key, um, the key thing that I, you know, I don't want to think of it as a cautionary note. I think it was something that you can actually uh, harness. And if you want to make changes, uh, you, you should uh, try to take advantage of that. Um, so I focus on personal networks, which are, are different than the, the type we've just been talking about. Um, uh, so uh, the, to contrast those types, uh, complete uh, versus egocentric uh, personal networks. So we were just talking about like members of a school, that one diagram, everybody's sort of in a, in a box together. Um, so that's called whole networks um, or it's called um, complete networks sometimes. So there's a defined boundary. A lot of times it's a, a defined relationship, some sort of social relationship, people who all belong to uh, the same organization, the same club, things like that. Um, uh, in contrast, egocentric focuses on uh, specific individual nodes um, and um, the sort of surrounding nodes connected to that node. So either it could be one step or two steps beyond that one particular actor. I'll, I'll show you an example um, in a second. Um, so uh, I'll also make a contrast between uh, generically referring to egocentric networks and personal networks. So um, uh, many people are familiar with the Ad Health study. I know people at uh, Washington have done a lot of analysis of it. Um, and the network center, or I'm not sure what, what their affiliation is, but um, there's been a lot of studies that have, uh, there's, there's a couple of really large schools that were, everybody was interviewed and all the students were asked to name their friends uh, and their romantic relationships. Um, and the, the top row, they show um, the wave one and wave two friendship networks. Uh, the nodes are colored based on substance use. Um, and then the bottom row is the, um, Romantic networks, those same that same school, the time points. Um, so this is a classic example of a whole network where uh, you have the same individuals included, time one, time two, um, and uh, the the network is not one network; it's actually two different networks. If you change the the relationship, um, and so um, that's like a bounded group, and you could. Uh, Think of an intervention done on the, the those who drink or those who uh, use drugs um, and see how it spreads throughout the network based on um, the, the sort of the, the characteristics of the network pre and post. 
You can also focus down in on one particular node within the network. Uh, so this is when you start getting to called egocentric networks. Um, so the top row, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a node that went from not drinking to drinking. Um, and you can kind of see all the different connections. Um, some of them are friendship ties. Some of those are romantic relationship ties. Uh, same thing at the bottom row. It's a, um, a, a student who went from not, not smoking marijuana to smoking marijuana. Uh, so there's a lot, of interest, a lot of interesting, really complicated things that are just surrounding one node, uh, but it's still within this same large organization. Uh, personal networks, in contrast, um, that's when you have a, um, a, a set of interviews with a set of individuals who are not connected to each other. And they talk about sort of their uh, con concepts of who is in their immediate social environment. So for this interview, uh, this is a study of unprotected sex among, uh, we're looking at uh, men who have, uh, men who are homeless in, in Los Angeles uh, and their sexual partnerships with women. Um, so this man named 25 people, I believe he didn't name 25 people. So those three uh, nodes that are, are uh, red colored, those represent uh, sexual relationships. Uh, and in particular women, he had, um, uh, actually that I think this, no, they were all unprotected sex partnerships, but we had 400, I think up to, no, there was 300 in this sample, sorry. Uh, we did another study of homeless youth and homeless women. Um, and this one was 307, I believe. So each man who was interviewed uh, talked about his own network. And so that was a different network for each person. And so the, the homeless man who gave these, this information about these nodes um, and then the lines between the, the, um, the sort of circular figures are whether they know each other. Um, he's not in the picture. He's just sort of reporting on this sort of surrounding environment. Uh, so that's a common way to visualize social networks, uh, yeah, personal networks. So it's personal because uh, there's no connection with other people um, th those people are, their only reason they're connected to each other is because they know this, this one person who gave all this information. They don't have any other social relationship. You kind of see that there's two different uh, groups there. Um, and uh, one of the red nodes links some of those people more than, than the others. Um, and so uh, we studied this. This is just one, um, one, ego, one uh, respondent's network data that we analyzed. You can use all the same uh, network analysis uh, uh, variable. You can construct the same variables on this network that you can on on the other networks, the the whole networks. Um, and I'll talk more about that and why that uh, actually complicates things. Uh, but you can analyze this with a multi-level approach, where um, I was looking at what predicted having unprotected sex, and uh, one of the characteristics that predicted it was how central the the uh, female sex partner was in the, the rest of the network. Uh, so there's a, a lot that you can do here. And I just want to make a distinction between personal networks and egocentric networks within a whole network and then a whole network. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I sort of gravitate to doing uh, personal networks, egocentric networks, um, it's not the only thing I work on. I, I do have worked on ad health data. Um, I like this diagram. I found this. I didn't make this diagram. I borrowed it from someone. Um, where uh, the egocentric approach kind of enables the, the mainstream social science approach where individuals are independent observations or a lot of times behavior change interventions are directed at particular individuals. Uh, it enables the um, introduction of networks in that context where you don't necessarily, uh, so when we did a study of um, people who lived in Skid Row, Los Angeles, we were looking at people who aren't necessarily part of some organization. You could say that, okay, well, they all live in this one geographic area or they all shared some sort of characteristic of being homeless, but that's not really, um, or, or experiencing homelessness, that's not really um, a, a well-defined uh, shared uh, social space. Really what we were interested in, it was all the different social uh, connections that one person had at a time. Um, so that's much easier to uh, sort of add on to traditional social science uh, than some of the uh, sort of classic network analysis approaches that are defined around an organization. Um, so personal networks, um, so in, uh, as apart from egocentric network, so every person is the center of their own network. Um, and so there, that enables some diversity in the types of relationships. So if you're looking at the egocentric network of students in a school, 
you'd be talking about other students, whereas the, the people who um, are experiencing homelessness, when they name people, they're naming people in their family, and there are people, other people on the street, they're naming people uh, who they went to school with, or people you know, they, uh, who they're working with in, in a job. You know, so, so that enables a, a variety of different types of social relationships that um, are influencing that, that person. Um, so, uh, like I said before, you can use all the same metrics uh, on egocentric or personal networks that you can on whole networks. Um, um, and uh, the concept of uh, composition and structure, you can, you can look at who's in the network and how they're connected. Uh, those are the, that's how that's um, distinguished. Um, one cautionary note, it is a secondary report. It's about the person's perception, their cognitive uh, perception of, of who is in their, connected to their network. So as long as you ask reasonable questions, and as, and if uh, you know you're interested in perceptions, so there's a lot of substance use studies that show that uh, people's uh, perception of who is uh, doing substances in their network um, is just as important as, or it, it might be important in a different way as who's actually using uh, substances. Um, so, but I just want to mention that that there is. Um, egos or, or personal network, the focal individuals can't necessarily uh, accurately say anything about the, um, the ties of people that, that uh, they're not directly tied to or may be tied to people that they're directly tied to. So those two steps away type people. Um, so as long as you're focusing on, on things that they can act accurately answer. So, the, um, so personal network data, uh, they can get pretty, they get pretty complicated fast. So let me just contrast this with uh, typical survey data. This is just an illustration of the data complexity. Um, each one of these rows represents a different person, and uh, the columns are represent like different variables that uh, they've been measured on in uh, a survey. So on top of that, then you have the network data. So you have each one of these respondents reporting on other people. So for example, this one respondent named these four people. Uh, and so in an egocentric network, um, interview, uh, personal network interview. I'm using those interchangeably, but I, I guess I'm pretty much focused on the personal network type. They give answers about each, each of those people. And so the second person gives answers about each of those people. So there's a multi-level uh, data set here. Each one of these people represent multiple rows uh, in the alter part of the data set. Um, and on top of that, you have each ego is reporting on who's connected to who. So this uh, matrix here represents all the uh, people that they've named and whether there's relationships. So the ones represent, yes, there's a tie, the zeros represent no tie. Uh, that's one person's uh, network data. Um, so for one person, you have these three different levels. You have uh, the ego level, their answers. Um, that level is typically questions about themselves, um, like you know how many years they went to school, whether they're married or not, things like that, just typical survey questions. The alter questions, it's questions that they're answering about other people. Uh, so first of all, they're listing those people and then they're answering questions about them. Uh, and then the network data, it's a matrix of, uh, in, it's a matrix of relationships among however many people that they've named. So if you have a sample of uh, 300 people, like 300 uh, men experiencing homelessness, like I mentioned before, uh, you're gonna have 300 networks. Um, so it's, it's, it ends up being very complicated uh, to process uh, and manage. And so this is one of the main reasons why I started working on this software uh, with some colleagues uh, a while back because uh, I tried using sur typical survey software um, and it's just not necessarily set up for processing this data. So you can use EgoWeb to collect the data uh, and to immediately export it into, um, I, I generally use R because there's, um, yeah, I can write a script and there are a lot of network analysis packages being written in R, but uh, other people use other um, other other software as well. Uh, but you have to use programs that are expecting network data. Uh, so EagleWeb puts it out in a very sort of um, easy uh, format to import into a lot of different types of network analysis software. And there is a lot of network analysis software out there. And a lot of the, um, I think some of the standard software is, is starting to have packages for network data. Um, but there weren't a lot of uh, network data collection software out there. So um, EgoWeb is one of them, there are more now. Um, but another thing you can do with uh, network data uh, or a, a personal network interview software that uh, helps uh, capture data is immediately 
after the interview, you can display uh, the image uh, to the person that you're interviewing uh, and uh, visualize that what they all the responses that they just gave you and uh, show it to them and use that to uh, collect exploratory data. Um, and so um, uh, I did this on a study with uh, homeless youth and homeless women. Uh, so this is a, 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 a woman experiencing homelessness who named just like before 25 people. Uh, the people on the left-hand side aren't connected to anyone. They're called isolates. Um, so they are just a bunch of people that she knew, but nobody else knew. Uh, and then there's these three separate groups. Um, so that's called components in uh, network analysis lingo. So that's like a, a, connect, a, a group of people who are connected to each other either directly or indirectly, but not to anyone else in the network. Uh, and what we did, we asked her to name these people. Uh, this is pretty early on when we started doing this at RAND. We wanted to know whether we were actually doing something uh, relevant and collecting uh, valid data. Um, so she was very easily able to name her family groups. These are all people that she's related to. Uh, she named these isolates tricks. So she was, um, these are our men she had sex with uh, for money on the street. Uh, she also named this group her sobriety group. She was in a, uh, a shelter that uh, was, uh, she was getting some um, some treatment for um, substance use, uh, but she also named this group the party group. Um, so um, what that shows is that that structure uh, enabled her to maintain these sort of separate behaviors. She could be sober when she needed to, and then she could be partying when she needed to. Um, so uh, that just you know illustrated the importance of that structure. Uh, this we did the same kind of thing with homeless youth, um, where we showed the picture and we asked them a lot of more exploratory questions and on top of a real in-depth interview with them about uh, decisions about um, using condoms or not. Um, and so this, like in a similar way, this uh, homeless uh, youth named his family, he named his friends, um, and then he named this person over here who's an isolate as a positive influence. Um, and uh, once again, that in, in, uh, illustrates the importance of structure because that person might be a positive influence on him, but it's not somebody who's connected to anyone else and is not in any sort of position to uh, influence any of the other members to be in, in, a, in a positive way. Um, so on top of these interviews, we did in-depth exploratory interviews, like I said, um, and there were some indications that talking to people about their network, talking to people about their decisions in the context of, uh, of a social network uh, it was a, a good technique for revealing latent motivation to, to want to engage in healthy behaviors and make some changes. Um, so there's this uh, homeless youth talking about uh, his sex partner wanting to take the condoms off. And so he just let her, even though he didn't want to. Uh, so he's articulating, um, you know, so that uh, that contrast in, in what he wanted and what he let somebody else do. Um, and then there was this other quote um, where uh, this uh, um, young woman wanted to, she was you know, very motivated to uh, avoid pregnancy and to not uh, catch a, a, um, uh, a disease uh, because of you know, not having unprotected sex. Um, so, I mean, she was able to articulate this sort of real sort of stressful contrast, uh, but you know, she was really, really focused on the, the feeling of this social connection with her partner. Um, and so to me that really, you know, that, that uh, highlighted the ambivalence that was going on inside her mind about what her behavior was in this social context. Um, so uh, that sort of led into the idea to use motivational interviewing um, along with these diagrams uh, to show people what's going on in their network in order to uh, trigger some behavior change. So um, motivational interviewing, it's a evidence-based practice um, probably many people are familiar with it on the call. Um, there's uh, you know, evidence that it works. So people, if they're saying things that they want to change on their own, and if there's, they're being led to do that in a very sort of neutral way, and uh, they feel like they're in charge, they're more likely to make those changes. Um, and this process increases self-determination and it reduces psychological reactance. So they're not getting, um, they're not feeling defensive about uh, the, the conversation they're having. Uh, they're feeling like they're in charge and they're making decisions as they're articulating the things they want to change. So we uh, conduct the pilot test of this approach using social networks on top of motivational interviewing with um, Housing First, 
uh, residents in Skid Row, Los Angeles. Uh, so these are people who have been given a, um, an apartment in, in a building in Skid Row. Um, and then uh, the programs work with them to help their, with their social or their uh, substance use issues uh, after they have their uh, main problem, which is homelessness um, resolved at least temporarily. Um, and this is in contrast with a lot of programs that uh, expect uh, their residents to be abstinent. Um, it gives them a, a home and then they work with them. They, they give them permanent support. Uh, so the intervention that we pilot tested added on top of the traditional support, uh, the social network support. So um, it was, as I said before, in Skid Row in Los Angeles, uh, we work with a couple of different uh, housing programs. So a lot of what is in Eagle Web today uh, was built during this project, um, although there's lots of different projects that have contributed to it. Uh, we initially did focus on HIV risk behavior, but we sampled based on uh, substance use issues. And so there were a lot of people in our small sample um, who uh, had not been engaging in current uh, sexual behavior. So it made it a little bit difficult uh, to kind of uh, identify a signal there. Um, so we focus mostly on the analysis on substance use, but that's uh, definitely something that we would like to target in the future. Um, so we randomly assigned some to get their um, this intervention on top of the usual case management and, and compared their um, responses about their own behavior and their networks uh, over 90 days. So uh, what the, the basic uh, intervention is, uh, so people who are in these permanent supportive housing, they have case management. So we're building this uh, interface on top of that. So initially we had facilitators who were trained by RAND staff uh, to do the um, case management. The idea was that this could be something that would be delivered by case managers. So they visualize the network um, and you know, they talk through all the different people, they name people, they say who is connected to who, and then they kind of see a picture and then they, we highlight answers to questions about substance use and support. Uh, and so this is sort of the backdrop of motivational interviewing. Uh, and the, the goal is to trigger this type of change talk that they, they're saying things that they have a motivation to change for. Uh, and they're you know, uh, saying it out loud and that helps them to build their uh, latent motivation to change. So this is an example of one set of diagrams that one person that was in the pilot study uh, saw. I took the names off and just added some labels for some keynotes. Uh, so the, the, um, each one of these diagrams is the same set of people um, just visualized in different ways. So the one on the left, uh, it highlights those who are highly central. Uh, so the, the, the most central one is number, the one labeled one. Um, and it's most central because it has the most connections going into it. It's highest degree centrality is, is the term for it. Um, and so it, the, that node is larger and it's darker red than the other ones. Um, so that's a kind of way to intuitively highlight and bring your eye towards particular people. Um, and then even, you know, it'll bring your eye towards the people who are, are smaller um, and, and lighter. Uh, and so the facilitator has a conversation. Okay, so tell me about these people. Um, and then after that, they move on to the alcohol and drugs um, diagram, where you can see uh, with uh, size and color, who are the people who the, the person said that they were likely to use drug, drugs and alcohol, and um, also the people who are uh, the 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 respondent or the participant says that they're using more when they're with this person. Um, so uh, it, you can immediately, your eyes drawn to the larger and the, the different colors. Um, and then the, the one on the right is social support. So uh, this the same concept, people who are larger in green are rated by the, the person as supportive. And those who are smaller and blue are rated not supportive. So you can see how one person like the number one uh, is very is highly central and is also uh, likely to be triggering drug and alcohol use. But it's also very supportive, so you can't just tell this person you should stop hanging around, hanging around with that person because uh, there's somebody who are important in a supportive way. Um, however, there's someone, uh, there might be someone in the network who's not supportive and is triggering drug and alcohol use and is not uh, highly connected. That's uh, that's a very different conversation about that person. So we did a lot of beta, beta testing of uh, the visualization. We weren't really sure what people were gonna think of it. Uh, so we saw some themes 
Uh, one, just in general, they said it made sense um, uh, and it made, made them see the pattern of people in their life. And uh, there was a lot of comments about how it was important to see this as an external thing rather than just thinking it, uh, or rather than just it being a conversation, you can actually see it. And it's, it's things that you just said, and it's, it's being uh, fed back to you. Um, and uh, people generally, across different studies I've done, they, they think it's, uh, it's definitely acceptable, it's feasible, uh, makes it easy to understand. It's not something that you, know, you have to be a specialist network researcher to, to uh, appreciate. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, evidence so far that I've seen and people talking about, immediately talking about changes. So they're seeing this diagram. Uh, they're not just looking at the diagram sort of like just as a bunch of different characteristics. They're seeing it as a story and it's making them think about you know, how their life is now and how they want to change it. And this, I like this quote because uh, the guy who was looking at his network he immediately starts using the language of the visualization. He says, I need to spend more time with the blue and less time with the big red dot. So for him, uh, he has a, now has a different way of articulating who the, the person is in his life who might be uh, triggering some problematic behavior. Uh, so like I, I said before, we randomly assign people to get the intervention um, and those to, um, to get their sort of usual case management. Uh, one thing we realized that we, we added in an, a, another provider midway through because it's, you know, it's challenging to recruit people experiencing homelessness or, or who are transitioning into housing. Uh, so we had another um, uh, partner. Uh, they did not have the same kind of case management as the first partner, which we crafted it around. So we did some analysis just of the, the one partner uh, on its own. Um, and what we found was uh, their behavior did change. Uh, so we compared their responses before and after and compared those who got the intervention and didn't. Um, and we saw a decrease in alcohol use, marijuana use, um, and uh, they had higher readiness to change rates. That's a scale of uh, people assess the different uh, ways in which they're um, ready to make changes in their life um, and their abstinence self-efficacy. Um, so, uh, and currently we're, I'm waiting for hopefully a final review of a paper that shows that there were network changes as well. Um, so if you look at the diagram, the one on the top is somebody who did not get the intervention and somebody on the bottom uh, is one who did get the intervention. Um, and you can kind of see how there, there's a, a big uh, number of uh, highly connected uh, red nodes on the, the, the top person after 90 days. Um, and that's in contrast with the one on the bottom where uh, there were a lot of red large nodes and the large nodes mean that they're highly connected. Um, they became former uh, drinking partners for this one person. And so that was the kind of pattern we saw over overall. There were fewer drinking partners and then the connections between the, those people who are triggering risky um, behaviors, there were fewer of those for those risky members. Uh, so these are the things that we wanted to see. Um, and um, now, uh, so the, the idea was that, um, this is sort of a general idea of behavior change because there was a, a few different projects I had where I showed people pictures of the network in a um, sort of exploratory way. And it just seemed like people had this sort of gravitation towards diagnosing problems in their life uh, based on seeing this picture of the network. Um, so there seemed to be a real sort of latent uh, curiosity about what the information meant for people in order to make changes. Um, the uh, example of people experiencing homelessness and transitioning to housing, that was just the first attempt uh, to sort of packaging a, a, an idea to pilot test. So um, since that was successful, uh, now extending it to other populations, um, the, the first uh, transition or the first uh, adaptation is for uh, transitional age youth. So those are between 18 and, and 24. Um, so it's very similar issues, but the population is very different. So they have uh, they have some similar substance use issues, um, but you know, they have other support type issues. So we are, um, and now that we've done this with facilitators, we're now having case managers deliver it directly. So uh, I think we just had the, the first one the other day where a um, case manager actually, you know, used, uh, used the uh, EgoWeb platform to deliver the, the intervention. Um, we don't have it in a face-to-face -face at the moment. She's able to do, use Zoom and do this in her typical 
um, social distancing, case management. Uh, one thing we did add is uh, add differently is not just general support, but we wanted to focus on pro-social supportive connections, the people that would be in their lives in the long term, since they are uh, a younger population. And so uh, just like before, we're doing a pilot test um, and we have four biweekly sessions. Everything is pretty much the same with the pilot test. So this is an example. Um, it's just sort of a, a theoretical illustration of what we're looking at. So again, we're doing the, um, the people who are highly central, larger, we're using blue this time, just to, um, to differentiate between red being a negative. Um, so we, we modified the software to make it uh, use blue instead. Um, but it's the same, uh, same idea. You're able to see different subgroups, uh, see how connected they are. And there's a story there, gets the respondent or gets the participant to uh, start articulating who the people are and what their what their story is with the, the different uh, groups. And then focusing on support, uh, we're looking at people who, um, who are gonna be there in the long term and not just people that they're hanging out with now. Uh, and so uh, and building off of that, we're talking about uh, drugs and drinking. Uh, so the larger red circles, again, it's sort of like a, a, a stoplight, yet a, a red, yellow, blue, the, or red, yellow, green. The green ones are uh, the positive ones. There's people who don't use, um, and then there's people that they use with, uh, and people who, who use, but they don't use with them. And then the people who are they're using with, um, and they use more than they usually do, uh, are the larger red ones. And so uh, this, these you know, multiple network diagrams kind of build off of each other. Uh, and another thing we're doing is like specifically asking them to talk about who they want to spend more time with, who they want to spend less time with, and who are some people who weren't in the network this time who they would want to add in the future. Um, and then the beginning of the next session, we um, are, and we also ask them just tell me a story about, you know, what are the things you might want to change? And it may not be that they want to drop or add people. It may be that they just want to, you know, stop interacting with the, the people in a certain way. So they may want to change their relationship, change their tie with people. Um, and then these, uh, the text that goes in these box, it's displayed in the next session so that the case manager can sort of revisit this and ask them how it went, encourage uh, steps to make changes that were successful, help them think through any problems that they had. So that's uh, pretty much just very similar that we did initially. This uh, project uh, is for uh, urban Native American traditional age, age youth. Um, and so we added in the network interview to a, um, a workshop that was focused on traditional uh, activities. Um, there's a lot of uh, difficulty that urban Native American people have as far as like engaging in cultural activities because uh, you know, they may not be living anywhere near people who are you know, from their same tribe. Um, or just in general, not the people who are Native American. Uh, so this workshop is intended to target that. Uh, so we added the network part to it. Um, currently it's, it's being done online. So we weren't really sure how that was gonna work because of the pandemic. Um, but these uh, young adults are able to go online, answer all the questions themselves, see the network, write down some reflections, get together in a group, discuss. They're, you know, they're able to see their own network. Uh, we provide them access to a secure file that they can see, but the, you know they're not sharing with other group members, so they can talk about general uh, aspects of, the, of networks. Uh, and it's sort of and it's and it's a group MI workshop. So there's the change talk kind of comes from the crosstalk uh, between the different individuals in the workshop. Uh, and like I said, it's a virtual format. So these are an example is very similar as before. We're highlighting the drugs and alcohol um, and the connections, but we're adding in this for them to reflect on who in their network uh, is engaging in traditional practices, like who are the people who are uh, American Indian but are not engaging in traditional practices. So there's oftentimes uh, a lot of overlap between substance use and, and traditional practices. There's you know, each person probably has you know a little bit of a different story, but there are some common themes that come across in these group discussions. So uh, one final project that I'll, I'll just mention, um, and it's just getting going, it's a kind of unusual project where we're building uh, we're focused on building theories about new ways to do interventions, and it's a lot of it is focused on what I've just talked about. Um, we're focusing on juvenile justice involved youth um, and using the similar network visualization and uh, motivational interview on top of that. The purpose of the project is to build um, 
multiple different models for how this can the intervention has been done. Uh, the the organization I'm working with, the policy research group, they're the lead of the project. Um, they've reviewed a lot of uh, different uh, teen pregnancy prevention projects and have noted over the years that there's not a lot of innovative uh, theories that they've seen. It's even a lot of you know use of the same theories over and over again. So this is an opportunity. Uh, I work with them on the, the idea of including the social network interventions, which is it's less common. Okay, I think I'm right around the the time um, that I targeted. So we can have a, a discussion. I can revisit any of those things. And if I went too fast for anything, you can let me know and I can go back to it, but or we can just have a general conversation. And I'm going to see if I can look at everyone. It's challenging. There are 33 of us, but I think I can see if someone raises a hand. I guess I'll use this time while we see who has um, who has questions to say um, that uh, I got connected with David uh, in the process of writing in our 21 grant uh, to the National Institute of Aging um, that I worked on. Uh, I had some help from Francis Anan, who's on this call and has done some social network um, work in Kenya. Um, and I'm basically studying the social networks of older women living um, in Kenya who um, comparing women living with HIV to women without HIV, because uh, we're sort of exploring the concept of social frailty or social vulnerability uh, and are interested to see whether that's different between HIV, um, you know, women living with HIV and, and other women, as well as what might be some uh, needs for that group and some potential interventions. So you, uh, youth as well as very old people can be <laughs> looked at. Oh, I, I have a, yeah, there's, there are studies of, uh, well, I have a study of caregivers of people with dementia, but there are actually, there's, I know there's research out there of people with dementia, their uh, networks. So yeah, I mean, uh, everyone has social connections that um, are gonna be important. So that may, makes them uh, good candidates for social network uh, interviews. I'm scanning for any questions. Give it a little bit of time. I don't know, Francis, if you, do you wanna comment on some of your work just briefly, just uh, what, what your application was while we see if there are any questions? If not, we'll, we'll kind of move on, but. Francis was one of the first research assistants around to program EgoWeb uh, interviews. There you go. Um, yeah, long time ago through. now. <laughs> yeah. so, for 2010 or so? uh 2011 yeah i was there 11 2011 to 2014 mm -hmm. so feels like a lifetime ago <laughs> mm -hmm. um yeah so for my dissertation we used ego web to collect data about um perceived social support and perceived stigma among um female sex workers in kenya and looking at how those factors related to each other and influenced um, adherence and viral suppression. So yeah, it was, it was an interesting project because collecting data on, at a network level allowed us to look at the comparative impact of social support and stigma from um, each altar. And so we were able to see that, that, that um, that network, personal networks that had people who were who had alters who were stigmatizing had much more of an impact on viral suppression relative to mm -hmm. um, relative to support. Yeah, I know there's there's an intervention that I've seen. Uh, I think it's called Engage, but they they use visualizations to help somebody identify someone in their network um, to be a supportive partner. And I think you know the the idea with the network is that you're if there is a lot of stigma, you're you're potentially identifying someone who is disconnected, or maybe it's like a kind of a, a weaker tie. That you know, if you have concerns about disclosure, you're picking someone who you don't have to worry about uh, word getting around. Great. I'm looking and I'm not seeing questions. I think so maybe I might have to do it. Um, I, I saw something <laughs> pop up. I don't know. I see something. Yeah, um, maybe I, not. I, I can screen on the participants. Um, it could be that people are still absorbing. Uh, if you wanted to go ahead and start uh, the second um, part, 
Let's see. Wait. Um, I think you did have a question in the chat. Ah, in the chat, in the chat. That's what I was looking for. There you go. How large of sample sizes are you able to collect data on? And how do you control for confounders or think about no mo models in this context? Um, well, the um, one of the reasons I mentioned about personal networks being good overlaps with uh, traditional social science is that there's really no limit to uh, collecting network data. I mean, the only, the only thing is there's respondent burden. That's pro partially what we're you know, using the software for to make it easier to do the, get through one of these interviews. Um, but, um, and controlling for characteristics of uh, egos is, I mean, you would use the same statistical models. I mean, talking about the uh, whole networks, there's, that's when you have to get into a whole different set of, um, uh, analytic techniques. Uh, there are techniques that use a lot of um, uh, random graphs, comparing what you get, what you have with the simulations of networks. But with personal networks, that's when you can, like, so if you have your network, each person who has a network, you can calculate something like density. You can calculate how many people in that network. You can ca calculate how many people there are, um, are drug use partners or drinking partners and have a number there or have a proportion there. So everybody can have a measure, and that's basically the same measure you would put into any kind of other, um, like a regression model. Uh, or you can look at things at a multiple levels. So looking at outcomes at the alter level. So you could look at dichotomous outcomes with their alters. So whether they've had um, uh, sex with that alter or unprotected sex. Uh, and so you can control for ego characteristics because these individual alters are not independent observations. They're all being named by the same person. So you can count for that non-independence. Uh, um, and so the sample size, I mean, it's really, it's just a matter of how, um, you know, uh, so in, anyway, let me give you an example. I have a study of caregivers, of uh, people um, of older adults. Some of those are dementia caregivers. There we have sample sizes over 2000. So the, you know, the challenge is putting it on an online platform and having a respondent base, uh, we, we are using this um, panel called Knowledge Panel. Uh, so we're interviewing their, their panelists. Um, so uh, there's no special limitation on the data collection uh, compared to regular survey. It's just that with the network data, it's a little, it gets a little intensive and it takes a little bit longer. Um, so anyway, hopefully that answers the question. I'm gonna ask Pamela's question. And then I think Alfred's, uh, he, he just put one in that we're gonna to get to. I think it shows some of the data uh, um, anal analysis approaches. But uh, Pamela just, uh, Shakan says, uh, if someone wants to start to apply this methodology in research, which could be a base, yeah, what is the basic guide to start? Um, where would we find examples of surveys to collect data that we can analyze with social networks? I um, with somebody who, who already was doing it. <laughs> yeah, and there's, um, when I first started doing this, there wasn't as many uh, examples, but there are now, uh, there were, you know, a few different articles. Um, now there are textbooks um, being written about it. Um, so there's, uh, I, I don't have any um, visuals to show. I, sometimes I have that slides with visuals, but there's, a really good book called Brea, or, um, uh, by the author Brea Perry on um, egocentric networks. There's another uh, book by uh, Chris McCarty, Personal Networks. So there, there's uh, you know a lot of examples out there in the literature. Uh, that's the best thing I can uh, suggest to you. And there's also um, you know colleagues that have used it. You can share their their uh, instruments. But you know the I'll talk about some examples um, in the, the the next part of the um, the talk, but, um, you know, the, uh, the instruments are, are similar to regular survey instruments, but, um, the ego web is sort of pre, uh, uh, built to do certain types of things, uh, that are, um, typical in, in network interviews. So it's not completely starting from scratch, but, um, I guess, you know, it would, but the, the thing is, is, uh, you know, it kind of really depends on the, the research question and what you're trying to study because every, instrument I have has different things in it, but um, there are some um, some basics that are similar that you can probably get from the, the literature. 
Then Al Alfred had a question. Can multiple respondents report association with one person and how does it handle correlation? Is the study design fully probabilistic? That is that sort of a good bridge to your next section? Well, I mean, that's that's a sort of general network uh, question. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's really a bridge, but um, it, it sounds like more like how you how you deal with this, this statistical issue of having uh, multiple people talk about the same person. So a lot of the, the traditional network methods for analysis are geared towards understanding that non-independence uh, when you have, a, if, you're, if you have people who are um, all talking about each other, then you really do wanna treat that as a whole network. Um, so if I was doing a personal network interview with a bunch of people and treating those as separate analyses, but I know that they're all naming each other, one way you can do that is match the names. Um, so you can, you can come up with some ways of collecting data that you'll be able to figure out if this person names that person and another person names that person, you'll be able to identify who that person is. So there's techniques for taking uh, per, a bunch of different personal network interviews and turning them is, into one whole network. It's, it's difficult, um, but if you have um, enough information, you can match. Uh, I do that with um, married couples who are talking about their networks independently. Um, and you know, based on a few different characteristics, you know, if the if the husband says this is my brother-in-law and the wife says this is my brother and they have the same name, you can pretty much bet that it's a, it's the same person, and you can build a sort of combined network. Um, so you're basically just treating that person as one person. Um, it it does get a little bit uh, tricky to do that. It's hard to know uh, if the same person is the same person. So oftentimes the the assumption is that these are independent observations. Um, and if you just like with the uh, just like with network data being somebody's cognitions about their network, uh, being different than, um, uh, you know, being different than actual, you know, real relationships. If you're really interested in the cognitions and how people seize the world, uh, that's, that's a little bit different than uh, treating these as sort of independent observations as the people uh, that they're talking about, because you're still measuring somebody's cognitions, like whether there's a lot of stigma in their network, where there's a lot of support in their network, it doesn't really matter if they're saying the same person that somebody else is saying, because you're gonna summarize that at, at, the, at a certain level, either by counting the number of people. Um, so anyway, it's not, it's, it's in, in some ways there's, you know, messiness to it, but um, it's a way to kind of get at networks um, in a way that you, you wouldn't be able to if you didn't do this type of interview. So, um, great. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Do people want to stand up and stretch and then <laughs> see some eagle web? <laughs> I can, I'm going to stop sharing this and pull up, a, um, pull up some other, yeah. Please feel free to, to, um, Put anything into the chat um, as we go along. I'll try and moderate. I did put it, I found the book that you were mentioning um, on um, egocentric analysis by uh, Brea Perry. Yeah. Um, I can in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, that, that's a really good. Um, and she addresses some of these statistical questions um, throughout that book. Um, so let me go pull up this other. Yeah, I mean, it's it's nice to be able to do these kinds of talks uh, even at a distance, but still a little bit of a <laughs> feel socially disconnected from the people who are on the seminar. <laughs> yes. There's a lot, of, a lot of names out there. <laughs> Is there a uh, lot of people behind these? Uh... Usually I can like look out in the audience and see if somebody looks completely confused or uh, if they're nodding their head or they're smiling or they're looking at their phone. Uh, so they just have to kind of guess. So um, there, are, I see. Oh, I see chat now, and then I'm not. So you, you've gone through all these. I think so. Okay. I think so. I'm looking. Uh, yeah. At, yeah. Everyone else. I think we've addressed great specific questions. Some people may yeah. use uh, uh, 
for other things, but it looks like we've got a good crew who's interested in seeing um, how some of the analysis is done. Just and again, yes, the disclaimer that David has is that this is just a taste. It's a very brief introduction. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, the the, the um, I'll explain how you can get some resources as well. Um, so you don't have to learn everything. Mm -hmm. um, so just uh, some background about EgoWeb. Um, so it's open source software. So it's on a, um, a code sharing site called GitHub. I mean, I never did anything with this stuff before I started working on this, but I, I did use a software. Um, there was a, a, a software that we purchased that did a lot of the same stuff um, but it, it did a lot. I was used to using regular survey software, programming survey software that I could do lots of different skips and, and um, customization. And it was very limiting. And um, so this researcher, uh, Chris McCarty, he, he's also one of the authors of a recent book on personal networks. That's also a very good introduction uh, called EgoNet. He made that, uh, he made a program of his that he developed in a grant. Um, available on a, a code sharing site. And so I start working on that software and it kind of over the years uh, evolved into different things. And so I'm calling it 2.0 now, just because there was an ego web um, on the site called GitHub um, that I, um, after a while, I hadn't worked on it in a while and then I went back to it. And then the, the programmer was sort of out of touch. Um, and so I was presenting on this new software and, and some people were looking at the old software. So I really wanted to distinguish it. And then also it was a, it was a very, a very much a leap from the old one. So there's, there's uh, I guess when you see the term ego web and there's some other completely different software called ego web. Uh, so if you see references to ego web out there, if it doesn't say 2.0, it might not be the same software um, that I'm showing today. Um, but uh, so there's this code sharing site. If you're, uh, you know, a programmer type person, you may know how to um, fork that and use it, and or or you could just follow the instructions and and download a zip file uh, that uh, lots of people have done. Um, so I'll, I'll point that out in a second. Um, so I don't know if this is. I don't think this is actually this the version that I wanted to share. So here's the diagram that I want to see. Okay, so um, no, that's not it. You can just look at this. So the um, oh, here it is. So GitHub is what I was talking about before. This is some uh, little mascot thing, Octocat. I don't know why, but you can uh, get the software directly from there. And there's instructions on a website I'll point out, and you can put it onto whatever computer you want to put it on. Uh, it is sort of, it is customized for web. So um, you have to add um, a company software to sort of run, run a little web browser on your computer. You're not broadcasting, you don't have to broadcast to the internet, uh, but it has to have that in order to function like normal. Um, and there's ways of exporting files and importing them into other computers. Uh, so you can share code, you can share data. Um, but if you put GitHub on a server, um, so right now the thing I'm using, not like specific university servers or RAN servers, we're creating virtual servers. So um, Amazon uh, Web Services, uh, I use something called Linode. You basically are just renting space in somebody else's server and then you can put Ego Web there. Um, and that's the demo I'm going to show you. So that way you can have uh, multiple computers sort of using the same thing in the cloud. Um, and then that's how we get respondents to do interviews um, who are part of large panels. Uh, they're all entering their own information into um, the, the web-based version. Um, there's also, um, you, I mean, if you have an iPad or an iPhone that's connected to the internet, you can also connect there. You don't necessarily have to have a computer. You're not installing anything, um, but you can install a, um, a mobile version of EgoWeb. And the point of that is that uh, sometimes you're in an area where there's no internet connection. Um, and so this allows you to collect the data and then sync it later on. Um, so you can use some sort of hybrid model um, where you sync data using the iPad. Um, 
or you can have some that are uh, collecting data offline. Um, so there's just a variety of different ways. And these all kind of evolve based on what projects need from um, EgoWeb and, and at mostly at RAND, but there you know, I have collaborations with UCLA and other universities that uh, have used EgoWeb. So there's a bunch of different universities um, have that have uh, researchers who are using EgoWeb in their own instance that they they set up. Um, so um, there's this uh, domain that I um, link to uh, a wiki, and if you type in egoweb.info to uh, a browser, it'll it'll go to this site that I'll show you in a second. Um, you to actually get the software to install it locally, you have to go to this GitHub, like I mentioned before. This is the URL here, um, and all these are in the. If you go to egoweb.info, you'll get these links as well. Um, I started up a <coughs> um, a forum where I can answer questions because I was get you know, I get a lot of questions through email. I just figured if I had a public place where people could go um, and ask the same question, maybe someone could go there and they could actually see that somebody else has already answered it or already asked that question and had it answered. Um, there's some Twitter activity and some Facebook group activity, not that much, most of it. There's been a lot of people who have asked me questions on the forum over the last couple of years. Um, so let me give you a tour. So what I'm going to go over is the main page of EgoWeb um, right now. So I think my screen is still being shared. So um, yeah, so like I said before, this is a server. It's on a, a service called Linode. It's just basically, I, you know, space and I had somebody install it uh, there. Um, it uh, runs on Linux. Um, so I'm going to, so this is the main page of EgoWeb that, uh, you always get to, if you click on this orange link, um, anytime you see that, that's usually on every page. Um, so there are some major main parts of EgoWeb, um, uh, in order to create a, a study and in the EgoWeb lingo, and this comes from a previous version of the software, um, study is, is basically all the materials to, to do an interview. Uh, so it also, um, it's just basically the name you give to that uh, set of stuff. Um, to create questions, to author, to, to um, modify how questions display, everything is in this uh, orange link here. Generally orange text is a, a link text. Um, once you've created the study, interviewing is a way to uh, input data. Um, there is also ways to send um, links to people uh, and they, they can click on the link and, and enter the data without having to log into this. Uh, or you can have an interviewer who um, has an account and logs in. Um, so data processing is a big part of EgoWeb because it has this sort of unique format. Um, and uh, we don't, we haven't uh, invested a ton of time into analysis, data analysis within EgoWeb because there are a lot of different um, analysis programs out there for network data. Um, and in particular, I uh, use R a lot because there's lots of different packages out there. It would be sort of redundant uh, effort. Um, and um, <clears throat> so that the idea with the, with EgoWeb data is just to export it in a way that other lots of other programs can import it. So it's not like a it's not a proprietary uh, format. It's just uh, comma separated values, um, and so those can be imported easily um, uh, if you know how to import data in the programs, which did take me a long time to do that in R. So um, I'll import and export studies. This is mostly to have your what you've done in one server or one computer um, set up in another computer. So you can either export all the programming you've done into this file called a um, uh, dot study file to XML file, which can be imported into another computer. So that's the only way if you have installed EgoWeb on your own computer. Um, to um, if you've done all the programming and then you have an interviewer, you want them to set up this important export studies. Um, I won't mention ultra matching. That's a sort of like a extra thing for now. Mobile is just information about mobile. Uh, user admin, that's a way to add people with different levels of um, account um, uh, rights. So you can 
have some people working on your project who can only see some things, uh, but not others. So uh, one of the main things that I wanna talk about is the wiki. So this is, I got to this page from, from typing in ego web info into a browser. Um, so I, it's a wiki because it's easy to quickly um, modify. So uh, right now there's, I have a few different projects where we're adding things to ego web, we're modifying things. And sometimes there's bugs that, that come up that um, it's, uh, if I ex have to explain to somebody how to do something, it's easy to just sort of type up an explanation and then put it into ego web if it's something that changed. So I'm mostly doing this kind of in the margins of my projects. Um, so there's lots of things that don't necessarily get updated immediately. Um, but there's information about how to install ego web here. Um, so this is the sort of uh, the table of contents. Um, you click on install, you can see how there's instructions for installing on the window machine, uh, a Mac machine. Uh, if you are able to do Linux or work with someone or know someone who, or can pay somebody to do this, you can set up a um, Linux server. That's the server I'm, I'm showing you. Um, and also there's an information about how to um, install. And sometimes things change. Okay, so for this uh, Windows machine instructions, you have to download, install this uh, software AMPS. And it's just basically puts in onto your computer, uh, the, the generally used web server file uh, programs uh, so that you can run ego web in um, a browser. It's, even though it's on a browser, you're running it locally and you're not really running it. You're not really um, uh, broadcasting to the internet. Um, so that's something that I never knew before I started working on this. Occasionally there'll be like some change to an operating system like Mac, um, some of the recent changes made it so that older programs didn't work. And so the, there was a while that AMPs didn't work and you had to go to something else, um, but now it, it works. So occasionally there's just this evolution of, of web-based type programming uh, that uh, changes over time that you have to kind of keep up with. Um, so things that that uh, that I found the most sort of disconcerting was that there's not really a desktop icon that you click and open and that's an ego web icon. Right. <laughs> so it's a slightly different approach. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you if, you're, if you're not used to this kind of technology, your brain really wants just the, something to click on. Um, uh, and, you know, it's not it's not that that couldn't happen. It's just that there would be, you know, so we're like struggling. I mean, not struggling, but you know, we have limited resources. I mean, basically taking project resources, there isn't like, this isn't like uh, generating revenue, this is free um, open source. And so there's not, um, not any kind of profits to be used to make things smoother. And so if I can use it on my pro projects and if other people at RAND can use it and other people that I collaborate with, um, we're not gonna necessarily take, like, we're, so right now we're making it, uh, we're improving the longitudinal interviewing. So um, if I want to re-interview someone about their network, one of the issues is that um, do I completely get them to start from scratch and name a bunch of new people um, that I don't necessarily know if they're the same people as last time, maybe they're saying the same names or not. We're adding an interface where we can actually ask somebody, okay, is this the same person you mentioned last time? Do a text match with the new name with, the, with other names and then uh, show them some of the answers that they gave. Um, so anyway, investing in that kind of thing is actually making the data better. Um, if we had, if I had unlimited resources, I would make this so much easier to install. And, uh, but, you know, I don't necessarily know what the steps would have to be taken. I don't even know how much that would, that would cost that kind of a thing. Someday it would be great, but um, that's not, <laughs> so there's lots of things that I kind of, I wish were better, but, that, and that's one of them. Um, so anyway, uh, you can get it to go on your local machine. It's not necessarily going to be the most um, familiar experience uh, if you've never done this before. But yeah, it'll pop up in a, you'll be using like a tab in your, uh, in any kind of regular browser. It is on your machine, but um, that does confuse people sometimes. So uh, even though these are lots of steps here, I, I know lots of people so you're, you know, you're getting this one hour workshop, but there's lots of people who I know who have used EgoWeb without me ever showing them anything. Uh, so that's good. And occasionally they'll ask me a question and I'll, you know, kind of help troubleshoot just based on uh, things I've run into the past. Um, but
but you know, I, I, I know it can be done. It's been done by a lot of different people. Um, I just saw a uh, chapter in a book come out recently about um, recidivism and uh, uh, people leaving prisons. And it was about using EgoWeb. And um, I had some email exchanges with one of the authors, uh, but I never really did any kind of workshop. So um, I, I know there's the ability out there. So if, if there's any sort of like sense that you can't do this because you're not familiar with it, that's it's probably not true. You can manage. Um, Were you going to show um, a, sort of an example of uh, mm -hmm. what a participant might see? Yeah, I'll, I'll show this to you. I just want to cover that there's. Um, Options for self-help. <laughs> I just want to make sure if you're uh, if you don't have a server. So the creating interviews, there are study settings, uh, and I'll show you some of this stuff. Um, uh, and then creating creating interviews, the qu the question modification. Um, so this is um, uh, I try to keep up to date, date as much as possible. I haven't had a workshop in a while. That's usually the thing that spurs me to modify this. But most of it's uh, pretty up-to-date um, and I'll add in some advanced features as we add them. Um, so anyway, that's that's how you can get a lot of information um, uh, on your own. So I'll show you, so I'll show you an interview. Um, um, so you, you're, you're asking for like, you know, what questions actually look like? Yeah, just what would a, what would a participant see? So let me show you some of the things that um, let me let me jump to um, okay. So this is hopefully this will look familiar. Okay, so um, what I'll do is I'll open up this tab, which will show you what people um, will see. But then I'll, in the background, I'll go to the um, same study. But bring up the so which one was I looking at? Um, okay, so this is a this is a screen that would appear for a participant. It's just like a basic screen. Um, I've named it Introduction. Um, this is the this is where you see the study name, um, and then this is the uh, ID of the participant. Um, so if I want to see that study, um, and I named that. Um, so this is all, this is the, um, so when I, I clicked on authoring, um, I found the study. Uh, so there's single session studies. Those are ones that just, there's no link, but these are um, multiple session studies. These are ones where you're gonna re-interview somebody based on the same ID. Um, so if you click on the name of it, you can see all the, all the behind the scenes stuff. So um, when I look at introduction, that's all the stuff in this text box. So this first page, the study settings page, there are just a few hard coded um, screens that come up. Most of it is just sort of you put the questions where you want to. Introduction is, is the first one that comes up for everyone. If you have text in here, it'll come up. If you don't have text, it'll skip over this page. So you see how it says, our conversation today will start, blah, blah, blah. That's everything that's in this text box. And it has a lot of like familiar looking uh, rich text uh, formatting. So you don't have to um, do much other than pr program this or you can copy and paste from Word uh, that already has the formatting and, and we'll retain that. Um, it, Word does add a whole bunch of crazy stuff. So that's not necessarily the, the, the thing you want. Sometimes you can just uh, format it here. Um, so now this is the, um, what, what we call the ego ID page. This is a way of um, uniquely identifying the person who you're interviewing. And you don't want to put a bunch of questions on here that are like demographic questions or anything like that. You just want to specifically identify um, this uh, person. Um, and also it might be the, the you, you want to go beyond that. You want to go the, I'm interviewing this person for the first time or the second time, or the third time. So I have a session in there. So all those questions that just showed up on this screen here, are in this ED or ego ID questions box here. So there's three questions that show up. And so this is this is the only part of ego web that where there's multiple questions that just show up on the same page very easily. There's a ways of, of getting multiple questions that show up on the same page. And I'll maybe have time to, sh to show that. Um, but basically this is the ID of the person. Uh, so on every, Every question is um, is one of these bars. If you're programming EgoWeb, 
Um, and new is just a way to create a new question. And that's always at the top. Um, so if you open this up by clicking on it, then this is where you get all the, um, the settings for this question. Uh, this is very minimal, all this is. And so textual just means it has a small text box. And enter the resident ID that shows up um, uh, above the, the, the question here. So it's just, it accepts text. Um, so that's one of the response types. Uh, another response type is what we call multiple selection. Uh, and that's where you can give them, present them with a, a bunch of different options. So here we have the names of the, um, uh, the, um, the interviewers. Uh, and then this is a, a checkbox that's also with a multiple selection question. Uh, this might not be the best example. Actually, this is not the one I wanna show, but anyway, this is, this is a key part of EgoWeb where you're identifying the person. So basically all the answers to these questions get concatenated and um, they turn into the, um, the ID of the person. So let me, I'm gonna go to a different one. That wasn't actually the one I wanted to show you. Um, um, yeah, uh, this is it. So this is actually the um, similar to the one that I was showing. Um, okay, so everything's the same, ego ID questions. We have the um, the ID of the person. Let me move with you. So then, this is a um, question called intro. And uh, once you have the ID questions, then you have this question box. That's where pretty much everything shows up. So this is intro. So all intro is um, okay. So there's a key part of EgoWeb that this is new in the last few years where um, it's, it's much more flexible than it used to be. There used to be just questions about the ego, questions about alters and questions about the relationships. Now it's, you can put those types of questions anywhere you want. So you have to identify whether it's an ego question um, and the question where you generate lists of, of names, that's called a name generator question. We can now have multiple different name generator questions. Um, I don't know if you knew that. Francis, if you've ever used any of the newer versions. Um, and so there's a couple of different new features that I'm just sort of experimenting with now. Uh, so you can ignore those for now. Alter questions, that's questions where it's going, it knows, it, eWeb just sort of knows to re-ask that question for every person that you've named, or uh, there are settings for asking that question with a, with a big list. And I'll show you examples of that. Alter pair, that's where you get the relationships of the, the types of people in the network. So that's when you, it goes through every single unique dyad. Um, and then a network question, that's where you display the network. Okay, so this is a very simple question, ego and no response. Sometimes you just wanna display text. So that's what that question is. All it is is text. So if you look at- um, David, can we see what the um, uh, participant would be seeing here? There was the question- this is, this is what the participant is looking at. This is, but for yeah. the actual survey, the, the social network questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll work towards those. Yeah. Um, but there's some basic ways of programming that I want to cover. Yeah. Um, so, so this is a, um, what I mentioned before, a multiple selection question. It's a subject type ego. So it's only gonna come, the only is gonna be one screen followed it, but it's going to be, um, they're gonna have options. So if you click on options, these are the response options. So this is what they see. Uh, in here. Um, so this is just regular survey stuff. This is just um, stuff that we try to you know, have it do the, the basics of survey research. Um, so let me skip forward. So this is what's called a name generator. Um, and this question, let me show, am I doing that? Yeah. So um, a name generator is a key part of the interview because you don't have a list of people. Every single person in a personal network interview that's interviewed has to give you a list. So there are lots of settings as far as how this goes. You can limit it, uh, you can set a min and a max, things like that. Um, so this person named 13 people. There's a way of giving a sort of a, a countdown. If you only need to add two more, uh, this person went on and, and um, only clicked, uh, only added 13 names. Um, 
So they clicked refuse and then, then went next. Um, that's just why it's gonna stop. From, so right now it says, um, you only name 13 people, you have to name 15 people, but you can skip next get, to get past it. Um, it's just sort of a reminder. Um, so this is, um, here's our first question about network, people in the network. Um, so let me show you. So basically that whole list shows up here. Those response options that we uh, that you can add, they show up as columns. Um, and um, there's a way of like bringing in text from a previous answer. So this is one of the previous questions. Um, and it says, okay, you said that you had these goals. Let me remind you what they are. Um, and basically answer one question about each one of the people in your network. Um, and uh, let me show you how that's programmed real quick. Um, this, this question is called um, support. So I look down my list and questions and open up support. So all of the programming for the display of the prompt, the question prompt is in here. Um, so there's some things that uh, I would like to cover, but there's not a lot of time. So you, you there's this is code for, uh, basically this is just a display of the code. The behind the scenes is all the code in here. Um, so this is it where HTML and you can write things, but that's, that's more advanced. Uh, you can control all the bolding and everything, but you can also uh, insert um, a variable that is going, that is previous in the interview that you can display the answers to. But most of it is, is what you see is what you get. Um, is the prompt for text, the, the question. The multiple selection, that's just like the other things where we have um, uh, options for. Um, yeah, there are some crazy things I'm just noticing on here. My uh, programmer just made a couple changes today and I asked him not to. And uh, this is my test server, by the way. Um, so um, we're still working on some things. So I'm just noticing some uh, things that um, I probably shouldn't be demoing. Um, but um, the, there's two options, two ways of presenting questions um, about a particular list of members of the network. You can either do this whole list and there's this asking style list option, or if you don't check that, you basically have to um, show the question one at a time. And uh, there's ways of, uh, let, me, let me jump to that. I have a more basic interview that would be better for showing this. Um, okay, so uh, the last time I did a, um, a, uh, a workshop was in 2019. So let me, I think I have a demo interview from that. Okay, let me, I just did this one today. Okay, let me jump to that question. Okay, so this is, all right. So this is the same kind of thing where it's a list option. So I've named all these people. This is the text I entered in for this person. So rarely, sometimes, often, it's just like a real common thing. And I only ask, ask it in a list style. The other option is, uh, so this is the same kind of thing. It's a list style. Um, well, this is not showing what I'm thinking. Okay, the other option is to um, fill in, um, you, you basically ask this question over and over again. So let me start the first one. Okay, this is the list style. Um, and the text is, can you briefly describe what your current relationship is with one? So this is the first person. So you can ask this about every single person separately. So sometimes you wanna have one question for one person at a time. Um, and so Eagle Web knows you just ask this, display this question once for one, and then it skips the two here. Um, the, the programming in that is slightly different. All it is is that this was, what question was this? Uh, comp 1B. Um, so when I open that up, there's this um, special code dollar sign, dollar sign, and that's how it knows to fill in the name. And that's when I have the list style unchecked. So that's a way to 
diversify how you present the questions. So it could be initials or it could be the full name of their contact. Um, it, it, it will put in whatever they listed, just like it listed here. This yeah. is this all comes from the name generator. Okay. Um, the the what I'm saying about the dollar sign dollar sign, that's the that's literally what's in EgoWeb. Yeah. And it's a special character. It knows that when it sees dollar sign dollar sign together to insert the name of the altar. Yeah. And it shows that question and, and it shows it again. Everything's the same except it changes what's in dollar sign dollar sign. So it starts with the first person, second person, third person. Um, so that's just a, a key way uh, that EOWeb works. So it has this list. And so either show the whole list or just show one person at a time. Uh, so let me skip to, so here it's just, you know, this can get redundant after a while and you might wanna make sure you highlight the name of their person because all the other text is gonna stay the same. So then we're back to a list question. Um, so now we're getting to uh, now we're getting to um, relationships. So not only we're not just focusing on characteristics of the people. Uh, we're at this other type of question. So this is called struck one. Um, so this is this is. This is like one of the key features of EgoWeb, why you would use this versus another, um, uh, you know, I program general survey software to do this, but it's very difficult um, both to do it and test it and then get the data out. So um, you'll see how, okay, so it's an alter pair structure type or subject type, excuse me. Uh, that one we just looked at, uh, alter 1B, it's an alter type. So basically it's telling you web to just display this either once per person on the alter list or display it once with the entire list. When you get to alter pair questions, the, the focus of the screens is on dyads. So either, um, so I'll show you how the list works uh, with the dyads, same kind of thing, asking style list. Um, and there's there's another option for alter pair when you don't have a list. So let's let's show what's different here. So we have this dollar sign dollar sign again, but now we have a one next to it. So it starts with one person, and then it asks about all the other relationships with that person on the list, and then it goes to the next person, and then the next person. So this list will say. Okay, so the dollar sign, dollar sign one um, does one, here is the, like literally it filled it in there. Um, and so it's starting with that person and then it, the list gives you everybody else. So when I click next, if I answer all these questions, then it goes to two, the second person on the list and it asks me about everybody else on the list. It doesn't bring up one again, because it's assumed symmetric relationships. So it doesn't, if one knows two, two knows one. Um, there are ways of, of getting at network relationships where you know, if, if somebody gives advice to uh, somebody else, that may only happen one direction. Um, generally on personal network interviews, there are a lot of respondent burden, a lot of effort that goes into answering all these questions. It's cognitively very difficult to think about um, you know, the, the uh, non-reciprocal relationships. So that usually doesn't happen. Um, so there are features in EgoWeb for doing that, but it's one of those things where I hardly ever use. And then every once in a while I notice it doesn't work. So I, I never uh, need to use it. So uh, it's possible that it's, it's not functional right now uh, because this is pretty much the way I, I do it all the time. Um, and I haven't had a project where we've needed to ask somebody about non-reciprocal relationships, because it's cognitively, it's probably asking somebody to do too much. So uh, you'll see that, you know, if I answer the questions, um, so um, one thing I want to point out, the, the, you can't answer these, I mean, I should probably, um, uh, this is an, an interview that has been completed. And so therefore I'm just reviewing it, but I should probably have um, shown you how to actually answer the questions. So um, I was in advanced. So this is uh, this is uh, the page for data processing. This is where you can see your your information. Um, these are completed interviews. They have uh, complete times. If I click edit, that means I can start the interview again. 
Um, and then I can change the responses. Uh, so that's not what I was doing just a second ago. So let me go into interviewing. Um, and um, I'm in this advanced thing. Okay, so now, because I clicked on that, it sets a flag to this as an incomplete interview. Um, and so I can either start one from scratch or click on this. And let me, and another cool thing, and you don't necessarily want people who are doing their own surveys to do, you can click on this gear icon and you can jump to a particular question. Um, so the question I was just at was, um, struck one. So now you can kind of see how to change responses. So sorry, I should have uh, done that before. So basically these are just check boxes. This row, uh, there's settings for making this um, so that it'll only accept one response or you could set it so that you could, if you had a different kind of question, like, um, you know, what is your relationship with this person? There might be more than one response accepted, but if we set it to one, it'll uncheck this one. If I check that one and it uncheck this one. Um, so these are questions I've answered before, but you can kind of see how this works. Um, so the list gets shorter every time. So it's kind of daunting at first, but now we're, you know, now that we're at the fifth person, we only have six and, and these other names. Um, so it gets shorter each time. Okay, and then you're done with that. But now we're at the set of questions that's about one person, uh, one diet at a time. So uh, if you see that one and 11 are on there, um, the way you program that question, it's, um, I struck two. So how often does dollar sign, dollar sign one, dollar sign, dollar sign two interact with? Rarely, sometimes often. So um, it'll fill in that second person and then it'll go to the next person and then the next person. <clears throat> so I don't wanna go through that whole thing, but um, that's the general idea. Um, I wanna jump into one of the interviews that has a network um, visualization so that you can see that. Um, let me go to um, this. Any questions while I'm finding another good example? Um, so let me let me edit one of these ones that's in here that has the visualization. So I'm going to. There is a question in the chat about comparing EgoWeb to R, and um, but you may want to get to those types of questions at the end. Just... Yeah, I'll I'll talk about that in a second. I mean, I'm mentioning some things relevant to that, but um, okay, so. Um, let me, um, where was I? This one. So right now I'm just reviewing a completed interview. So this is not data entry, but, um, this is someone who's answered a bunch of questions about the relationships among people. Um, so we're going through this list. We're almost done. We're almost done one more. Okay. So here's the network question. Um, so it displays the network of people that were just entered in. Um, and so let me show you how. Um, so uh, one of the key things is you have to define for EgoWeb when to draw a line here. So even though you've asked this question, these people don't know each other. These people, yes, they connected recently or they haven't connected. Uh, there's a thing called expressions where you have to, basically it's a logical statement saying that this counts as a tie between two people, these two don't. Because EgoWeb doesn't know what this text is. It doesn't know, you know what's a real relationship or not. Um, so there's some programming in the background that you link this display. So all those people that you've entered in. Um, and so there's a couple options here. I can make this, um, so this picture is right here. I can make, make it bigger. Uh, so if I'm talking to somebody about their network, this will pop up like this. Also, if I'm a case manager, I can click print preview, which gives me a second time, a second way of uh, looking at bigger, but it's easier to, to print out and have some labels up here. Um, so there's a text box in here. Um, 
And um, if I wanted to use this in a presentation, I can take off the names. Um, this is uh, the text I entered. This is a, an image that I uploaded. Um, so that's kind of like a, a little bit more of an advanced thing, but that's just basically using uh, HTML. Um, and then uh, let me go into this one. This is an MNI session authoring. So um, right here. So that is a that is the one of these questions at the bottom here. Um, Interact network. So I inserted the image into the into the um, the prompt box. So with the formatting there, I mean it's 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 a little bit tricky to get it to come up correctly. Um, it's a, a network subject type. That bigger text box is not just textual; it's textual PP. I guess that's for paragraph. Uh, some of the labels and the um, uh, the naming of thing I didn't necessarily choose the way it was just sort of the programmer picked something. Um, but uh, if you scroll down, there's all kinds of settings for how to display the uh, the nodes in the network. Um, so there's um, so right here. Okay, so um, the node color I picked. The option I picked, I could have picked like a question. I could have picked, okay, let's make the, the people who are supportive um, larger than the people who are not supportive. What I picked was degree centrality for this one. And I picked the color uh, blue. So basically it just knows, to, it does math on the network. It decides that these are the ones that have the most connections. So if you count up the lines, these are the ones with the, the most number of lines. So this person has four. Um, and so they're darker and blue, uh, whereas this one only has one. Uh, so therefore it's, it's smaller and lighter blue. This one has none. And so it's the smallest and the lightest one. Um, so this is just automatic. And this is like a way to get people to immediately see that. Um, there are all kinds of network visualization programs out there. Uh, that do way more than this, but this is just sort of the, the basics of what we need for either doing exploratory interviews or giving somebody immediate feedback. Um, like it used to be that red was the only color and then we made blue the default because we were working on a project and we want that to be a little bit more um, neutral. Uh, we didn't want it to be red because we're using red for uh, to kind of show the substance users. So you can change the, um, the shape, the size, so we also have node size based on degree centrality. So we kind of lined those, those two things up. Um, when we get to the support network, I can hear background noise. So I think somebody wants to speak up. So just you can say something if you want. So here's the support network. And this is different because there's size and color based on something other than the network structure. Um, so uh, everything's the same, I just scroll down. Um, in, in the other workshops that I've done, I, I give sort of exercises and people can kind of play with this on their own. Um, so the, the node color, uh, this box is like the default, but um, underneath it, you can pick a question, support either is what I picked. And so that's the name of the, um, well, um, the uh, actually that's the expression. If I picked support, the question support, it would give me all the options that showed up and I could pick different um, colors for the answers to that question. Um, uh, so I'm gonna say what, one more thing about the visualization and then we'll have questions um, because this is, you know, it's a lot of stuff to add in there. And I have to tell David that this is, so um, alt, there's this key thing, alters are adjacent when, and there's this box here. What that's referring to is an expression. And then this is the most, probably the most complicated part of EgoWeb, although the, the basic one is, is pretty simple. Um, all expressions is, is just, it produces a one or a zero. And it does this for alters or for ego questions. If you wanna skip questions, you basically set uh, logic to say, okay, display this question only for these alters that meet this um, criteria. For this, it's doing it based on the um, an alter pair question, the one that's about, do these two people know each other? So uh, basically it's gonna produce a one if 
that pair of alters have either of these two questions that were um, asked and answered in the, that, that one part of the interview. So we don't wanna display lines between people that don't know each other, but we're gonna display lines between people who either they know whether they connected or not. Um, so I, basically I have to tell this Eagle Web in this question, when to draw a line between these two people. So it, it takes that entire matrix of configuration of relationships and it uses a visualization algorithm to place uh, uh, the names and the nodes of people on two dimensional space uh, in order to put people to, who are sharing a lot of connections in common closer to each other um, and putting people who don't have any uh, uh, connections in common further away from each other. And it tries to uh, minimize that as much as possible. But as I've uh, kind of de demonstrated a little bit, and as I've seen in my study is that this makes a lot of sense to people if they're talking about their own network. I mean, they immediately, you know, usually see, oh, these are my friends from wherever. Um, the only time that I remember in a, in a uh, exploratory interview showing a network of people, um, a network display to someone who just answered the questions was when the interviewer thought that the person had been making up answers anyway. Um, so it was kind of a good test of that because she didn't, she said the network didn't make any sense to her, but the interviewer kind of thought that the, uh, the person, the, the homeless woman wasn't even really paying attention to her answers and was just giving uh, answers. Um, so anyway, I think I'll, I'll stop right there in case there's any uh, questions that, so there was one question about the difference between this and R. Yeah, the, that's really uh, yeah, it's it's a little longer than that. So it's a, I'm curious about the reproducibility of using Ego Web. I'm using R to conduct a social network analysis for part of her dis dissertation, um, and, and thinks she thinks Ego Web may be better. But she wanted to be able to share the analytic steps to visualizing her network and con conducting the um, network analysis. Is there a way to save or share that process within Ego Web? Um, well, uh, well <laughs> um, let me try to just say a few things that hopefully will answer some of that. So um, basically there's no, uh, should I use ego web or R because they're, um, uh, ego web is, is sort of, a, is primarily for conducting interviews. Uh, if you're not doing an interview, if you're not collecting data from someone in an interview, there is no, no reason to use ego web. I, I mean, theoretically, you could do it if you wanted to um, enter data and kind of visualize it right away in a kind of quick way. Um, you could, if you had a bunch of data that you wanted to hand enter for some reason, uh, you could do that. I've used EgoWeb in a sort of a workshop to kind of teach people networks. I give them stories about relationships and people have to identify the, uh, the actors in it and the, the relationships. And so just answering a bunch of questions, but generally the only reason we, have ego web is because if you have a bunch of people out there you want to collect data from through an interview there are ways of doing network analysis from data that exists you can take data from various uh, online platforms you can take data from lots of different sources there's people who analyze uh books and shakespeare for relationships um so there's relationships out there and there's lots of electronic data that have relationships um so um, analyzing data, there's there's only a few things that you can do with EgoWeb. Mainly, it's for capturing that data, packaging it so that you can use it for in other things. So R is what I use all the time. So I, I generally visualize my networks in R because um, this is sort of like one at a time. <clears throat> that's that's basically what EgoWeb is is good at. Um, and it's it's good at doing it one at a time with a person and showing them the network network. Um, although there is a there's a part of ego where you can kind of go through and change some of the visualizations with drop down menus. Um, but you know, I like R because if I have hundreds of uh, respondents, and I want to dis <clears throat> display the networks three or four, four ways, I can write a script and do all that. I can produce numbers, uh, much I can produce measures in a variety of different ways. Um, so I just hopefully that kind of um, clarifies that a little bit. Yeah, I think there's a, um, okay, I'm going to give you a couple of the questions, maybe you could, can address at once. So the follow up to that one was about exporting the data as a data set of ego relationships. And so yeah. you might want to talk about the different types of export um, data. Yeah. 
There's so a data, question about, yeah, so, let, me just, let me give them all since we don't have much time and then we can see. There's a question <clears> about how long it takes um, participants to, to complete usually. And then somebody wanted Francis to say something about how hard it, or easy it is to learn this as a non-expert. Yeah, so the, um, the usual thing is, it all depends on how many questions you put in there. You can limit the number of people that you ask people to name. That's gonna be a major factor in how long it takes them. Uh, so usually it's like more like how, how long can you actually uh, get somebody to sit in one spot and answer your questions. Um, for the study, I, I talked about my marriage study. The first time we did it, we asked them to name up to 40 each, They're the couples, just because we weren't sure where to stop. And so we, we generally stop at around 20, 25. Uh, you can do fewer if you have like a real concentrated uh, type of project, like my caregiver study. We're only asking about people who provide support. So the, the numbers go down there. If you're online, you can only plan on somebody being on, on um, online answering your questions a little bit longer. If you're actually like sitting with them in a room, uh, back when we used to do that, um, you uh, can like you know, get somebody to stay in like for 60 minutes or so, if that's as long as you want. But uh, so it could be just like up to, you know, 50 minutes is probably the, the lowest I've had um, in sort of like a mean uh, up to like an hour if it's like more like an online or maybe even a, a phone interview. Um, so I don't know. I mean, uh, there's been lots of people who have done, there's been, I'm collecting uh, dissertations and uh, Francis, you're the latest one to have ego have used for your dissertation. Um, there's been a few uh, people that I haven't really given a lot of um, support to have done it on their own. So I, I know that it, it can be done by people who are I mean, that's been part of the goal and make it intuitive. But anyway, you can add anything you want if you have anything to say about that, how easy it is to use. Sure, I can jump in. Um, I, I found it um, actually quite easy to use when you, like after you get over that initial hurdle of figuring out where to go and how to enter questions. Um, so yeah, I think for me, um, the biggest hurdles were, since I was collecting data in Kenya, getting set up there with the team, making sure that they had um, everything downloaded on the appropriate computers or tablets, and that their data transfer systems were set up in a way that I could receive those weekly study files um, that, that, that I could then export into Excel or R. Um, and then I think the... The, the biggest piece of advice that I could give with respect to this is, is not unique to network analysis, but it's really thinking about um, and being really intentional about the questions that are included in the survey. So especially for that network analysis component, um, those questions are asked repeatedly. So for example, for my study where we were looking at social support and stigma, we could only really have one or two questions about each of those. Um, about each of those constructs in order to keep it within a time limit that was that felt reasonable. We were also asking about, I think we asked about 13 um, social network items or items of all of the altars. Um, we capped it at that. And so just being really careful about um, choosing those items and also when you define who you want those altars to be, because that really has an impact on the um, on the conclusions you're able to draw when you get your data. So the platform itself, I think, was very straightforward um, to use after getting over that initial hurdle. Um, I'm also happy to put my email in the chat if it would be helpful. If anyone has questions about like supporting a team <laughs> overseas and getting set up with how to do this. Um, and I'm, I'm no longer at UW. I'm, I'm actually at on the East Coast now in Connecticut graduated, so it's possible. And um, um, I'm happy to answer any questions as well. So I just want to point out this support forum. I mean, this is basically just ways of asking me questions. There's nobody else usually answering questions, but um, uh, you know, this is, this is the URL to it. Um, and uh, you see there's a lot of a variety of different um, questions about like errors that some people get. Um, or about you know inst installation issues, or you know how to like how to do another specify. Um, generally, a lot of these things are already in the wiki. Um, 
but sometimes people ask me how long does it take to program an ego web survey and um generally the programming part is not the thing that takes a long time it's the things that francis was just talking about making decisions about doing a survey um and um so and then like sometimes you might program it and then realize it's, it's taking too long and so you have to go down and change some things the actual changing of the survey is pretty quick easily you can just delete a question it's pretty simple but making a decision about how to word a question that takes a long time it takes a lot of thought and it takes a lot of a lot of like really thinking about does this really get it what you want because if it doesn't then you put somebody through answering the same same difficult to understand question over and over again for different people in their life there's a question in the chat about whether you um sort of began at all with a pilot uh sort of of the study um and did anything like a community consult to help you design the initial survey and contain that you know and the number and nature of the questions to the things you were most interested in. Um, yeah, I mean, depending on what study that um, you're referencing, I mean, the, some of the, the results I showed were from a pilot, the pilot study. So, uh, but prior to that, we did um, just sort of more like user interface type testing where we were kind of changing the way it displayed. Um, so for my current study, um, I did that with both case managers and with the uh, uh, the youth who had been experiencing homelessness who are who are housed um, basically went through the whole thing and just had a had a second interviewer come through and and just ask them you know a bunch of questions about their experience using it and, and they re made recommendations that we used to to make changes so yeah i do that as much as i can and i think it's really important when you're talking about an interface um so uh depending on what study that but the the caregiver study, we you know test it mostly amongst ourselves to kind of make sure that the questions made sense. But it's it's you know often just looks like a regular survey, so it's just the same testing procedures you would use for testing an online survey. You would use so testing the visualization part. That's another thing you want to make sure that people are. You want to try to get people to articulate what it is that they they think that they're seeing, because um, sometimes they may not understand. Um, why their network came out looking a, a certain way like they may if it's a really dense network where there's lots of connections uh, you'll we'll see a lot lots of lines that will be sort of like on top of each other and they're not sure whether they should be looking at each in particular line and it can't see them and it's really confusing you have to uh figure out a way to to give some instruction that says when when it's at, at that point everybody's connected to everybody so just kind of look at the group as a whole um so yeah i mean it's like any other kind of uh, inter interfacing with human beings with computers, you should try to um, do some uh, testing to kind of understand what, what people's experience is. That sounds great. Thank you. I think you've answered the questions that we got in the chat. Uh, I think Frances has has kindly given her email. Uh, David, how do you feel about, uh, well, I guess, people reaching out to you the forum is the best place um um are you i, mean, I don't mind the email i just you know yep. the uh the answering questions online sometimes i can link to another answer that somebody gave and it's just a little bit quicker that way um but um certainly if, if anybody's interested in like that that study about the um the juvenile justice we're actually looking for uh people to, to be engaged in partnerships if anybody wants to you know have any sort of question that's more of like you know collab research collaboration for sure just send me an email about that don't put that on the forum um but if you have a quick question about um how to program something and you didn't see it on the wiki just feel free to post something in the in the the forum that's great but uh, email's fine you yeah recommended my the um the brea book uh is that also a good source for analysis of the network data yeah or you have another yeah. recommendation yeah, there's a lot of analysis. That's mostly analysis, but there are sections on on data collection um, and the personal network one as well. Um, so uh, I do have a section in the wiki on. Well, no, I don't have anything that relates to that. I should put that in there. Um, that would be good as well. They do reference. I mean, they 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 point out software that you can use. So they point out uh, Ego Web as, as one of the options. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of the Brea Perry book. I would. Um, also, if you search for her on YouTube, you'll find a couple of really good um, uh, workshops she's done on on egocentric uh, network data analysis. Um, that uh, where she walks through analysis, so she gets that multi-level analysis. Uh, that's 
that, that's a, been a really useful book. Uh, but a lot of the analysis is is generally um, same kind of analysis you would do with networks, but you just have to you're repeating them over and over again for each individual respondent. Um, yeah, so I, you know, EgoWeb since it doesn't have a lot of analytic, um, it, basically we depend on other programs. Um, uh, I don't usually get into that in the, the workshop too much, but just one thing about exporting, I didn't actually talk about exporting. That's in data processing. So if you look at your, um, your study in data processing, you can export data in a lot of different ways. So you can just export the questions about the respondent, questions about the ego alters. So it's like a row, one row for each alter that you've named. So that's the multi-level data set or this is what's called an edge list. So it's all the answers to the questions about the, um, the pairs of alters. So this is all comma, comma separated values and you can put that into uh, other programs. That, that is wonderful. Um, I know I'll be in touch okay. as, as I start to actually <laughs> analyze my data perhaps, but uh, it, is, it is a really uh, fascinating sort of way to, uh, you know, area of research. And we really appreciate your sharing your, you know, your baby, no the ego web, <laughs> as well yeah. as really interesting interventions. I thought this was super fast, but <laughs> hopefully it sparked oh, some yeah. interest in something. It's in the age <laughs> of Zoom, sometimes people get overwhelmed if you do too much. Um, yeah, I understand. To, maybe we can get you out to do a more hands-on workshop at some point. There does yeah. seem to be interest here. We have as many as 33 people um, during the lecture and some people dropped off. Yeah. So Wait. the next thing I'm thinking about doing is just making like little videos. So I did this for a conference presentation where I did a video of me and um, that worked out pretty good. I figured out how to actually do that pretty quickly. So I'm going to maybe start doing some how to like YouTube videos on how to do basic things so that um, it, I am, I'm trying to get more people like, you know, I think that this is a really useful approach to adding social relationships and social data. Um, and, you know, the challenges, a lot of times people are not sure how to do it and they're not experts in uh, software development or, or um, network analysis. So um there are uh you know i found it's like nice it's nice to see that you know somebody published something using ego web that i haven't like had it spend a ton of time with so i feel like you know i've done something um that has enabled that in, in some way that it was minimal effort on my part because it was able to be replicated across different people so i think doing some videos where you show you know basic things will be um help help to make it a little bit more accessible as well but people have been doing it on their own. So I know that it's, it's possible. Wonderful. Well, All right, yeah, anything else? General, generally, everyone seems pretty happy to, to okay. learn more about this. And I think the interest level is rising here. So uh, we really appreciate your time, David. OK, no problem. All right, thanks. Nice seeing you again. Wonderful. Nice seeing you, Francis. Okay. Good to see you, too. Bye. You're in Connecticut, uh, where? In, yeah, I'm on a I'm on a postdoc between um, VA Connecticut and Yale. Cool. So all right.